Jessica just warned you, it is going to be recorded. Um, thanks all for joining us this month. We've got a, a slightly different edition of the community discussion around business models. Um, this month, we're going to share with you a, a preview of the open catalogue um, that the the three people who you can see on the screen at the moment um, have been working on for a while now. So that's myself, Martin Olu, and Gertrude moina who you'll get to meet in just a moment. Um, so I'm going to share a presentation. Um, so that should just be loading up now for you. Um, if anyone has trouble seeing that, do let me know. So the, the flow of the presentation today, we're going to start with um, telling you a bit about why we think this is necessary, an open catalogue of, of business models, as well as what we're trying to do with it. Um, show you which actual models it's got in it. Um, give you some examples of what each model will consist of and um, explain a bit about the roadmap going forward, what will happen next. Now, um, we do have slides, which we don't usually have in these sessions, but I still very much would like it to be an interactive session. Please do um, interrupt at any time. You can put your hand up. You can just unmute and ask something. You can ask in the chat. Um, all of those things will work. Um, but I would ask somebody um, if other people can keep an eye on the chat because I can't see it while I'm sharing my screen. Um, and you can ask questions, you can give us feedback on things, you can make comments, um, it's, it's all welcome. This is not meant to be a one-way street. So to start off, we're talking about why. Um, I wanted to ask, um, in turn, I'll ask Martin and then Gertrude to introduce themselves briefly and just say a little bit about why they think this work is important. Um, Martin, if we could start with you, please. I like this world where men come first for the first time. Thank you. My name is Martin Olo, um, founder of FabLab Winam, and uh, uh, right now working with Make Project. Um, this work is very important to me and to us because. Um, it is going, it's going to help us to have um, one stop shop where we can do references as maker spaces, as fab labs, uh, a place where we are able to, um, to consult each other and see what is, um, what is that model that has worked for somebody else and do you have possibilities of trying it out. We are going to have a lot of information that can help us um, you know, basically a place of reference. And it is very important because at times you want to do something and you really don't know where to get it. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. Gertrude, if you could also please introduce yourself and say a bit about why you think this is important. Hello, everyone. My name is Gertrude Mawinago. Um, I have expertise in project management, research, community engagement, and currently I'm supporting on the MAKE project with developing a catalog for business models. And I actually find it very privileged to be working on this particular aspect of the project, considering that I've been working closely with maker spaces in Africa for almost three years now and counting. <laughs> It's been um, opening and educative, and I hope to continue to work in the industry to be able to continue to support maker spaces. Now, speaking of the open catalog of business models, I think it is very important because this particular work is set for maker spaces, and it would help maker spaces both existing and new ones to implement specific activities very well such that they would be able to generate enough revenue to financially manage their spaces um, because 
this model is specifically built around the various activities that makerspaces implement or that makerspaces undertake. And each activity has its own model. So it, it gives an in-depth um, understanding of the key elements that makerspaces should consider. And beyond those key elements, it also goes on to add a toolbox that makerspaces can use to um, develop models for the very things they are doing. And this toolbox is also very important because makerspaces operate across different areas and they target different people in the activities that they implement. And so I think this open catalog of business models would go a very long way to support makers spaces to be self-sustaining. Yeah, thank you. Thank you both very much. And if I could just add my own thoughts onto that. Um, the reason that um, I wanted to do this work in the first place is because, um, because a lot of business, of a lot of maker spaces are struggling um, because they're typically started by people who um, are involved in the community or who have the technical skills and not so much experience in running businesses. Um, but at the same time, maker spaces and, and fab labs and hacker spaces and um, you know creative spaces and all these different sort of flavors. I think they add enormous value to society. And so I think we need more of them and we need them to be able to survive. Um, so that's why um, we're doing this work to develop an open catalog of business models. And I wanted to just say a few words about what it is we're trying to create. So the idea is to create a source of inspiration. It's not gonna be um, a prescriptive instruction manual because um, there are so many different situations, we can't possibly know what's going to work with different communities, but we can provide sources of inspiration that, that have worked in other situations. It's intended to be as universal as possible, so that it can be applicable in many different geographical locations, you know, to different income groups, um, different continents, all of these things. Um, that obviously makes it more complicated to provide specific information but again we're coming back to the idea of providing a source of ideas and inspiration rather than precise how to but having said that we also want it to be a practical tool so it's not just that you can get the idea but once you've got the idea there will be some guidance on how to to move from that towards implementing it so um, we're going to give you, as I said, a, a bit of a preview of, of the contents today. And these are, I wanted you to keep these in mind. This is what we would like to be judged against uh, um, as to how we're doing. So I'm going to start off by telling you about the actual models that we've got in the catalogue. Um, so the, the scope at the moment is business models for maker spaces and for small scale production. Um, and we've got three groups of what we're calling business model elements. Um, I'm gonna go into each of these groups, but the first one is uh, all around sharing of expertise. So based around sort of knowledge or skills that, that you can share with others, either by teaching it to them or by doing things for them or with them. The second group of, of business model elements is based around asset sharing. Um, so there is some asset that you have or create um, that you then help other people to access. And there's a whole set of business models around different, um, different roles in a product's life cycle. Um, so we're going to talk through each of these in turn. But first of all, I just want to say that all of these business model elements, we're not expecting makerspaces to use them in isolation. Um, it, we expect that you would choose a portfolio of them and, and build up a, a, a selection of ones that work together for you in your context. So it's not trying to provide a single business model that the whole uh, organization is based on. It's a variety of different um, value propositions that you can offer to the market that can work together. So diving first of all into the expertise sharing, the models that we've got in this one, are um, training, 
which is obviously sharing your knowledge and skills with others, but with a focus on education and certification. Events and edutainment, which is, is similar in many ways, but it's um, when the focus is on ex the experience and learning can happen along the way. Um, so that's sort of organizing events and fun activities, maybe for children, maybe for adults. It can also include hackathons and these kind of things. Um, the third model we have under expertise sharing is consultancy. So the expertise that the makerspace um, and, the, and the team of personnel have Using that to solve problems or deliver outcomes for others, um, we had one of these, in fact, the first one of our um, conversations this year, it's uh, available on the, the YouTube playlist that we'll link to later, that was about consultancy. And one of the models talked about there was, um, well, one of the offerings rather, was um, consulting on opening up other makerspaces. Um, that's you know one of the reasonably common things for, for makerspace owners to do. The next model we have here is uh, business services, which is about using your expertise to perform tasks that deliver a, um, some kind of a product for others. So an example of this might be web design um, that some makerspaces are getting into uh, having people who can do, offer these kind of services to those in their community or, and to other businesses. And finally, um, startup support, which um, can often be a combination of some of these other elements, um, but is really about putting a combined package around um, the, the creation and growth of new businesses. Are there any questions or comments at this stage before I move on to the next group of models? And if there's anything in chat, could somebody unmute and read it out for me, please? We don't have anything in chats yet. Thanks. So moving on to the second group, which is all around um, shared access to some kind of an asset. And these are both tangible and somewhat intangible assets, as you'll see. The first few are the tangible ones. So um, space rental. So this is something that um, many, uh, many makerspaces do is they um, they may not own the space themselves, they're often renting it from um, a landlord, but they then can sublet part of it um, to, to small businesses um, and so on. And the it may be on fairly short term contracts, um, but the idea is that the person that you're renting, renting it to has, has exclusive use for a period of time. Um, the second model we've got is around space hire, which is much shorter term and would typically be um, space that you use yourselves some of the time and then hire out for events, um, you know, a few evenings a week or a few days a week or something like that. Third one we've got here is machine access. Um, so providing access to machines or, or some other form of equipment. And we're going to use this one um, as an example um, a bit later on and, and dive into that in some more detail. Uh, membership, um, which mm, is creating shared access to a community and to other assets, including space and equipment. And the final one here, again, an intangible one is or it can be intangible, is more about a marketplace, which can be online or offline but is about creating a space where buyers and sellers can find each other. Um, and this was one of the models that, that came up in the, um, in the discussion we had around working with artisans. Um, we had um, a couple of speakers who, who both have a, one element of their business model in working with artisans is creating a marketplace for them to sell their, their goods. So I'm moving on to the third group, um, which are all around different stages in the value chain of, of creating products, product life cycle. So you can sell materials that other people use to make products. You can develop products, which is designing and prototyping, um, either something that is going to be produced you know, on an ongoing basis, or that can just be what a custom or a bespoke item that's for single use. 
Um, you can have product manufacturing services, which could include machining, um, could include um, yeah, manufacturing and selling um, products under your own name. It could also include making and selling machines. There's contract manufacturing, um, where you're kind of selling your manufacturing capability as a service and other um, organizations can, can pay you to make things on their behalf. Uh, we had um, a discussion about that in, I think it was the February edition of the business models discussions. Um, quality control. Now, this um, is, is an interesting one that we're experimenting with in a, an ongoing project that we've got at the moment, um, which is the, uh, the Innovative Manufacturing in Africa um, project. And um, the, the concept here is that, that makerspaces can play a role by ensuring the quality of products made by others um, and earn revenue from doing that. There are models around repair, so maintaining products or returning them to use when they're broken. And there are models around recycling, so um, processing, um, whether it's products that have been used before or whether it's byproducts from some other process so that it can go back into the value chain. So those are the models um, that we've identified as, as being used from our research. Um, and. Um, I just want to ask if there's any comments or questions at this stage before we then go into an example of what um, what each model contains. I can see there's a question about whether the slides will be made available for access. Yes, absolutely. We will share those. We'll share the slides afterwards. Um, so, Martin, I wonder if I could um, hand over to you, please, to talk us through machine access as an example of the kind of information that's going to be shared for each one of those models that we've just talked about. All right, th thank you so much, Anna, for a beautiful presentation. Um, as I'm moving to specific uh, item, I just want to ask uh, participants, just think through if there is any model which you think has been left out, you've seen it working somewhere, or you've been thinking that's a, a business model that can be uh, used in maker spaces, please uh, put it down there. And so we can uh, probably have a discussion around it. Um, thank you. Now, um, as one of the elements which was talking about um, uh, access to resources, now we have, machine machine as one of the resources that uh, can be accessed by um, by community members entrepreneurs and and business people mm -hmm. so while defining it uh, or describing it it's the access of machines tools or other equipment for people and businesses to use so basically um, when um, a makerspace or a fab lab has machines, then they allow people to use such machines, um, of course, at a fee. And what are the major variations? This, this is where uh, you, you are offering a space where people can come and use equipment versus allowing people to take it away. For example, um, when tools are hired, there are tools which cannot be taken away while there are others which can can be taken away for example if you have a cnc router it uh, most of them are big and might not be carried away and so hiring it might mean somebody accessing it for such number of hours or such number of days while the other smaller tools like power tools somebody can hire it from you go work with it outside there and come back so uh, yeah so it is more, more practical for smaller tools which people take away comparatively. Now, what are the potential impacts? Um, there is chances of improving skills, enabling people to learn on how the, 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 these tools are used. In fact, in, in many 
many such spaces, they have uh, safety and basic use training to enable the users to learn how to use such machines. Um, because um, at times when a skilled person is using machine, it reduces cost uh, on, on, on the person who wants to use it compared to when they want your, your, your expert to, to use it for them. Um, there's enabling of startups. They can test the market. Uh, um, startups have a chance of testing the market uh, let's say they, they they have a product where they're going to use um, a machine like a laser cutter. So before actually uh, putting money into buying such a machine, they will be able to, to access this machine from such a space to test their market. And once they, they have uh, a validation that uh, the, the product can, can be successful, then they can now go ahead and buy. There's also a reduction of co cost for existing businesses. Uh, so um, basically pe people doing businesses have a chance of accessing numerous machines without necessarily having to buy them. Uh, let's say you are working on products which need a number of machines to be, to be used. So you don't need to own this. What you really need is access. And this is uh, um, is able to allow allow them uh, reduce the cost of their production. Then there's improve, improving quality of locally made products. Um, when such machines are available, you know, these include some um, modern and sophisticated machines like CNC machining. Uh, you realize that they might not be so much within the the, the country. And so the local manufacturers, for example, in Kenya, we call them Juakali, they have a chance of accessing such machines and able to help in the improvement of the quality of the products that they, they have. Um, now, when we go to challenges, uh, some of the challenges which are there is the, the high, high startup cost. So uh, as a makerspace or a fab lab, <laughs> You actually need to to have you actually need to have this machine, whether you are going to buy it or whichever method that you are going to have it. You need to have it so that other people can uh, access it from you. So some options are, uh, are to seek donors, uh, sponsors, or partners with equipment. Like you can also partner with manufacturers who can probably give you the machine, um, maybe at a a certain way in which you can buy it, maybe higher purchase or something. And, uh, or even if you team up with other, maybe other businesses or other maker spaces and you bring uh, a machine together so that you can co-share using it. But generally the startup cost will be higher. Then there's also the element of um, maintenance of such machine. So um, there isn't so many, expertise around who can help in the maintenance of such machines. So it can also be costly. Uh, for example, um, myself, I'm based in a town called Kisumu and you don't get so many expertise like this. So at times you have to, to bring such expertise from Nairobi and so it involves a lot of cost. And of course there can be chances of uh, uh, a time lapsing when machine is not being used or otherwise you have to learn how to do the maintenance by yourself. Then there's also the element of health and safety. It's very important to ensure that machines are operated safely. You should consider training, monitoring, risk assessment, and plan what to do in the event of accidents. So you have to have including policies related to, to safety, risk and safety. You have to make sure that um, of course, your policies should include that a machine cannot be accessed by somebody whom you have not vetted and known that can access, can use machine professionally. So we also have other related models like uh, training, which also come hand in hand with machine access because you need people to to be trained to to 
to access machine, but you, the the machining um, the training can all is also a model that whereby um, you can use machines to train people as um, as a business model. There is also sales of material since you have the machine, you can also stock material so that you sell to those who access ma machine to use. And there's also provision of membership uh, whereby um, you are, you are, your customers who are accessing machines can probably subscribe to a given fee for a given package. Let's say you say that if you pay such amount of fee, then you are able to access two or three machines for this period of time. So those are some of the models. Uh, next, Anna. Thank you. Uh, so uh, here we want to talk about business model canvas. This is uh, actually one of the beauties of, of this um, catalog that we are developing because it will, basically provide you with a lot of information which is already provided and you can only um, customize according to the needs. So when we are talking about uh, the business model Canva, we have uh, nine components that we are going to talk about. So let's- fast. Chinese technology. So um, let's start with uh, uh, customer segment. So, uh, you have to know as a business, you have to know uh, who are the customers that you are targeting. So in, in this case, we have people who want to learn. We have startup businesses who want to prototype and experience uh, and, ex and experiment. We have established businesses who use machines in their work. Um, for example, the, the wood workers, uh, the metal workers, uh, uh, maybe people in clothing, if you have like embroidery machines and all that. We have entrepreneurs who can just, uh, who can use the machine to make money. There are entrepreneurs who see opportunities. They know that people need key holders out there. They just come and use the machines to produce that. Then how are you going to, relate with the, your customers. Now, this is also a very important question that you need to look at. So here we have listed online advertisement as a way in which you will be connecting to your customers, advertisement via tra training classes. We have walk-ins and there are also refer referrals. And then what channels would you use um, to, to reach your clients? Um, we have, again, online advertisement, we have training classes as a channel, we have walk-ins, we have co-location uh, where uh, a, a machine can be put at a place where it is most needed. For example, you can decide to go and put a CNC router in a, in a, a workshop where there are a lot of woodworkers so that a lot of people will be able to access it there. Um, now, when you do all this, uh, what are some of the um, revenue uh, streams that you'll be having? You can, you can plan hourly, um, you can plan hourly charges for machines, you can have membership subscriptions, uh, you can have revenue sharing agreement with people who use the machines. Um, uh, for example, you can agree that in every product that you 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 will be able to sell, we will be able to um, share maybe in this percentage. Then there's also cross selling of other other services such as training and materials. Um, and how is the cost structure? There is. Uh, when you are looking, because actually the whole problem about businesses normally come with how you want to cost your, your products. So there is machining purchase cost, there is maintenance cost, there should be allocation and power costs, there should be advertisement, uh, oversight personnel, material and cons consumables. 
So all these are some of the causes that you must be aware of so that you make sure that you are actually in business. Otherwise, you might be thinking that you're doing business, yet you are not. Now, who, um, what are some of the activities that you will be able to do? We have attracting uh, customers as an activity. We have machine maintenance and we have managing of the access or how people are able to access it. Um, the, the resources, what are the key resources that you need? Because we are talking about machine access, machines, equipment, and tools are is the main, main, um, main uh, resource. We also have the accessible location within with power. So that is very important because um, machine that we are talking about, most likely it must use power. Then who are the key partners? You must know the key partners because it's important for that business to thrive. Now we have machine, um, we have machine manufacturers or resellers. So you have to relate with them because at times you might even need some machines from them on, on higher purchase or even advice on those machines. We have material suppliers, we have government or other NGOs, uh, those who support uh, local industry. We have businesses who use those types of machines. For example, here where I am, we have a number of uh, businesses who use laser cutters, the others who use CNC machining, others use vinyl cutter. So easily you need to know them because at times you might need something that works for both of you. Now, having gotten all this, where is the value proposition? Ability to learn, uh, skills, offering the, capa uh, the capacity, the capability of the machines at a lower cost or lower hassle than buying them. So you will be able to have value where the machine can be accessed at a very low cost. Then there's ability to test new ideas or, or products uh, or processes. And there is also a value in improved efficiency of production processes. Thank you. Anna, thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Martin. Um, so so that's um, so that's to show you the kind of information that would be provided for each one of the models. Um, but because we're trying to make it widely applicable, that's obviously still quite general to different. Um, it, it's offering you sort of alternatives and possibilities, but it's not one specific um, uh, value proposition. So. Um, We've also been working on a toolkit that businesses can use to take the, um, to basically take it from that to something that's more specific to themselves. So I'd like to hand over to Gertrude um, to share and to take us through uh, this questionnaire. And just, um, again, I just want to emphasize that we're um, very open to uh, feedback and comments, um, whether in the chat or put your hand up or unmute and, and ask questions. Um, we'd be keen to make this an interactive session, so please feel free to share your thoughts. Thank you, Anna. Please let me know if everyone can see my screen. Yes, thank you. Okay, great. So. In addition to what Martin presented on, we have a set of questions in our toolbox and examples to help make our spaces to provide specific answers that would help them to implement a specific model that they are trying to carry out. So in this toolbox, we used training for specific groups of people as an example. And so the toolbox covers value, costs, resources, place, and communication. Come to value, the first question says, what is the specific revenue stream 
this talks about the service or product that you intend to offer. And so you see the example says training in 2D modeling and laser cutting. The next question says, why do you offer this service or product? And then in the example, it says, because the carpenters in a community lack the scale and as such produce furniture with measurements not being so accurate. That is the reason why they are offering this service, which is that learning and applying the skill would help the carpenters to make products with high precision. So in this example, we are looking at ourselves as a maker space cited in the Egesu community, and we are trying to develop a tailored model to implement for carpenters in the Egesu community. So the third question says, who will benefit from this service, which is the training? And this is the user of the training. When we go further, you would see that we have separated the user from the, the person who benefits from the training is the one who pays for the training. And so in this instance, the user for the service are carpenters in the Ajusu community. And then question four says, what will the user get at the end of the day? Over here, the intention is to be very specific. Yes, we know that we are providing training in 2D modeling and laser cutting. But what are the key things that the carpenters are going to get at the end of the training? And so you see in the example box, it says skills in 2D modeling, skills in laser cutting, certificate completion and then two weeks access to our maker space on completion of the training to enhance more hands-on practice and so this would be very very specific to what the maker space intends to give the users or the people who are going to benefit from the training and we move on to costs under the cost toolbox the first question says who will pay for this service, which is the training that you intend to give the carpenters in a Jesu community. And so in the example box, it says donor organizations that are interested in support artisans. So in this case, we see that the buyer, which is the one paying for the service is different from the person who is going to actually benefit from the service. In an instance where that training would be paid for by the same people benefiting. The example box, the makerspace has to indicate that it is the same carpenters that are going to pay for that training. Then question six says, what is the breakdown of items that would be paid for, both tangible and intangible? And so as a makerspace, what are the key things that you are going to use to implement this training? And these things has to be paid for. You are going to make use of a laser cutter, raw materials, utilities, that's electricity, water. If there are any others, you have to include it here. You probably have to pay a laser cutter aspect to carry out the training. Supplementation process that has to be indicated here because at the end of the day, you are going to pay that coordinator as well. And then if you're going to need a grant or marketer to find that donor organization who is going to pay for that training, that has to be in indicated here. And then use ops as well. So every single thing that you are going to need to implement the training and for which would be paid for should be indicated under your costs. Then the next question says, how much is the total price for your offer? And so you add up everything in your cost session, and then you put up the total cost over here. So in our case, we have thousand cities as the total cost. The next question says, how will you be paid by the buyer? And so it is very, very key that you indicate how how person who is going to pay for the training service is going to pay? Is it going to be a one-time payment? Is it going to be paid in installments? If it's going to be paid in installments, how often? Would it be twice, 
Would it be three times? Would it be four times? Which specific time will the payments be made? What percentage of payments would be made at what point in time? So you have to be very clear on that at this point as well. Then you get into the resources that you'd need for your training. The first question says, what human resource or expertise do you need to implement the delivery of your training from beginning to the end? And so over here, we would need a 2D modeling and laser cutter aspect. We need a grants person, a process coordinator. Then the next question says, what specific tools, machines or devices do you need to be able to implement your training. What this does is that after you make the list, it helps the maker space to know, okay, I need laptops. How many laptops do I need? Do I need 10 laptops? Okay, how many laptops do I currently have in my space? Pay rent five more to be able to implement that training. If I don't have a laser cutter, how do I implement the training? So these things are very important that you are very specific as to the tools and materials that you would need so that you are able to plan for them. Then we move on to place. Yes, we want to offer training for the carpenters in the Ejusu community, but then where are we going to offer that training? Would it be at our maker space? Are we going to have the training at the space of the carpenters where they do their work, or it would be at some other place. You have to be very specific. So in our case, we intend to offer the training at our maker space. And so it is indicated here that training would be offered at the maker space. The next question says, where will you find your products or service users? Now we are talking about the carpenters in a JSO community. We have to be very specific as to where we are going to find these carpenters. If we say carpenters in the Jesu community, is that to say that when we go to the Jesu community, we are going to see carpenters all over the place or there's a protection of the community in which carpenters go there to do their work. We have to be very specific so that when it's time to reach out to these carpenters and engage them, it would be much easier rather than not knowing exactly where to find these carpenters. And so in our case, indicated that the carpenters are at the market square in a Jesu community. In that case, when it is time to reach out to these carpenters, we know exactly where they are and it would be easy to assess them. The next question also similar, it says, where will you find your buyers? is the donors who are going to pay for the training that we are going to give the carpenters in the Jesu community. Also, we have to be specific. So in our case, okay, we've come across some donors with pages on LinkedIn who are interested in supporting carpenters. And so we intend to reach out to them. We are able to engage them on paying for the training that we intend to give to the carpenters in the Ejusu community. Let's say, for instance, if there is a donor organization somewhere at Edum in Kumase, then over here would have indicated that we are going to a donor organization in Edum in Kumase. So when it's time to engage them, we know exactly where to look at to be able to find the donors that we need for this training. And then we come to communication. Which communication channel will you use to assess your users? Now, already at place, um, we have identified that our users, being the carpenters in Ejusu community, are found at the market square in Ejusu. How do we engage these carpenters? Are they people that we can engage online? Are they people that we can engage via? calls are they people we can engage via email in our case we have identified that it would be best to engage these carpenters through an in-person engagement and so when it's time to sell the idea to them to let them know what we are offering them and what they stand to gain from the training i'm sitting somewhere and calling 
on phone or sending an email or going to social media. We would go to the community, the market square in person to be able to communicate with these carpenters. It is very key that you find a suitable communication for your users so that they are able to understand the message that you are trying to put across. Then the last question says, which communication channel will you use to access your bias? This is also very, very important. Again, for instance, if your bias, which in this case is your donor, has an office in a doom, and then you sit in your office elsewhere, and then you send them an email, as compared to you going there physically to the office to engage them, perhaps going physically to the office. To so over here, you have to be very specific on which channel would be more convenient and effective in using to engage your bias. And then when you're able to come up with specific answers to these questions, it would give you a detailed overview of the things that you need to do to be able to successfully carry out your training. So this is what we have in our toolbox. And please do give us suggestions on the kind of questions you think we can include in our toolbox to make things better. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking us through that, um, Gertrude and, and Martin before that, um, for sharing the machine access business model canvas. Um, I have put a, a link in again in the chat to a very simple, very short feedback form. It just asks for your name and it's got three questions. Um, it would only take a minute or two to fill in and it would really help us to just um, gather your perspective on um, on whether this is something that's useful and what can be done better. Um, we're also really keen to hear your thoughts in uh, in this session, so in the chat or by putting your hand up or by unmuting and, and speaking them out loud. So um, the last thing I just want to, to talk about, unless there's any um, questions or, or comments at the moment, is just to give you a view of the, the roadmap going forwards and what we're gonna do from here. So we're at the stage of, of finalizing the content. Um, we've, you know, we've identified the models. Um, we're structuring the content that we've got it, um, as we've shown you today. And we're having um, various meetings um, and, and sessions um, last week, this week to, to get feedback from different people, to, uh, pointers of how that we can improve it further. Um, and that's why we're looking for feedback from you. Uh, at the end of this month, well, beginning of next month, we'll be publishing the content. So that it'll be the whole manual. It will have um, the kind of information that Martin showed you about access to machines. It'll have that level of information about every one of those models that we talked about. Um, but it will still be in a sort of in a document format. It'll be something that you can download. You can use it yourselves. Um, and it'll be released under a Creative Commons license. So we really encourage people to, to use it in whatever the way they, they can find it useful. Um, we have secured some funding um, so that later in the year, we're gonna be able to take that from being just a document and use the same content, but turn it into a website so that it'll be a bit more user-friendly. Um, you'll be able to kind of click through when it says to related models and things like that, rather than having to, to flick through the pages. Um, so that's something that we're quite excited about. We don't have an exact date for that, but it should be towards the end of the year that we'll be releasing that. Um, and I also want to make the point that, you know, this isn't, this has been done under the MAKE project. Um, this is, um, you know, a deliverable for that, but it's also going to be a living item and a thing that goes forward. Um, so my organization, Manufacturing Change, will be supporting this um, for the foreseeable future. We'll be looking for ways to expand it um, to different sectors. We're always interested in um, finding out about new models that we can add to it. Um, and uh, so, yeah, we'll, and if you've got any ideas about ways that you think it could be expanded in the future, then, then please let me know. Um, So that's the end of the presentation. Um, I'm just going to go back and have a look at the chat and see if there's anything uh, 
any questions come up there, but if anyone would also like to, to unmute or, or chip in, please do. Um, please do feel free. So we've got some some comments about. Um, oh yes, uh, we have. Uh, there was a great suggestion about um, with the the artisan model and the cost of that creating a model where the cost is shared between donors and, and artisans. Yes, that's that's a really good point, and um, I think that's something that we could maybe bring out more strongly the fact that that costs can be shared by multiple partners um, and. Um, I've messaged um, messaged you directly, Ochola, about um, hopefully learning a bit more about that model. That sounds great. Um, a question, uh, question from Mustafa. I'm, I'm just reading it. I have a question on machine access. Recently introduced a local woodworker to a wood router machine into our space to learn how to use it he wants to purchase his own won't this model of training on machine use go a long way to create competition for us if it continues for a long time and will it be sustainable so that's that's a really interesting one um there are definitely situations in which it can create competition for you um but i tend to think that with sort of some creative thinking about partnerships it can actually be that it benefits the whole ecosystem and and doesn't take away from your revenue streams so for example um the local woodworker um you may want to make sure that they you know are you offering repeated access to your machines like beyond doing the training because um if people do the training and then they want to use it is it their only option to go and buy it? Like, can you so can you find a way for them to um, have ongoing access? But then some people will find that they use the machines as much as possible, you know, more than that, and want to have their own. Um, so you could look at other models of making money from that. Could you supply the machines to them? Could you have a maintenance contract with them where you supply it? Could you be taking over training of new employees that they have could you partner with them in some way so that when if you need access to more machines than you have in your space you can also work with them um, so I think there are um, there are a lot of options and I would like to think that strengthening the local ecosystem um, I think there's usually ways to find it out that it can benefit everyone um, Obviously, that can be a, a challenge to find that. Um, I hope that goes some way to answering your question. And I think Martin may have some more to add there. Martin. Yes, yes. Maybe I just want to add that at times, at times it might look like a competition, but if you get more users, if a lot of people learn how to use it and it will increase demand because how many people can afford it? Just a handful of people can afford, but a lot of people might might need to use it. So if 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 he can get it, and probably uh, a few of them might get it, but they get it for specific products that they have. So uh, it will expose other people to know it, but then they realize that you are the one who is doing the training. So if we you train so many people, then a lot of use come in place. Even the customers, uh, the number of customers will always increase in such situation. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that, Martin. That's that's a great point. Um, any other any other questions? Um, we're we're very happy to provide you know um, our thoughts and and on particular business models and questions like that. Um, but we're also keen to get some feedback from you on the format that we've presented and like what you think is missing or how it could be more useful to you. So um, we'd be really grateful if everyone could fill in the feedback form. It's very short. And I've just posted the link again in the chat. Um, I don't see any more questions at the moment. Um, if, if there's something that I've missed in the chat from earlier, please, um, please put your hand up or, or unmute and, and say that. Um, otherwise, I think we're going to um, close this session for now. But once again, please do fill in that feedback form. And we'll be back next month for another um, 
another community discussion we'll be back to our usual format of having people focus on a, discussing um, who are involved in a particular business model and we'll be looking at recycling next month in August we'll advertise that thank you so much goodbye everybody goodbye